recording good people so we've got everybody as needed uh, thank you for joining so let me share the document the working document on a CNC torch table so today's meeting is on a CNC torch table for the first half hour 11 to 11:30, and then 11:30 we're gonna get into the filament maker part so the main people for now on a CNC torch table so we've got Chaz Oliver and Abraham as far as um, doing some real technical development on that based based on the prior work of what we have already with OSC so for background um, let me share the, the document here so please see the document let me uh, actually probably share the permissions so everyone can edit Abraham and Oliver you guys can hear and, and uh, you, can, you guys can speak and Chaz Cannot, Oliver cannot speak, but here and see well. Okay, Chaz can speak. How about Abraham? Abraham. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. Good, good. Yeah. Okay. Good. okay. Oliver says he he can't speak. Oliver, because you don't have a microphone or something, or. Normally it works, but this time it doesn't. Okay. It's the Jitsi, huh? Yeah, well, sh should tr try to troubleshoot it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could probably figure it out later. Um, so you can do the text. That'll be that'll be acceptable for now. Uh, but definitely want to get that communication channel ripped a little more open. We've got Abe as well. Okay, excellent, guys. Uh, the document. I'm gonna type it in again for the people who just joined. Okay, that's the working document. Uh, so let's start with uh, where we are on the torch table as far as OSC goes, and background history of what we've done so far and what what's to be done done now. So the history actually goes back to. Uh, if you Google all the OSC work throughout the years, back in 2011, actually, we had a first instance of the CNC torch table. And that was um, using EMC, which is Linux, which is called Linux CNC, using a laptop, um, a laptop that actually had a parallel port. And because parallel ports are kind of rare these days and we want to work with la normal laptops without going you know having too much uh, disadvantage on equipment um, we'd like to definitely have it USB run uh, USB controls so Linux CNC works only on USB so it's it's not not the greatest uh, but we did get it going we cut a lot of the tractor parts back in this was back in 2011 when we had the big production run of all the tractors you might have seen some of the pictures we uh, produced a lot of the wheel mounts which were basically rings with bolt holes. So basically a bunch of pre precision stuff that saved us countless hours on having to do that torching manually. And that was using half inch steel at that time. So over the years, we've tried again a couple of times to do that, to do, finish up the torch tip. We had some people over the summer, we actually worked on a capacitive height sensor because the thing that we haven't done the first time around was we just had the, the, the torch moving around but without height control. That means if the metal bends or if your surface, like upon heating, metal is going to bend or upon traveling the whole surface of the metal, if it's uneven, you get a worse quality cut. The cut is not as good if you don't follow the metal very closely to about, you know, like three millimeters maybe an eighth inch up to maybe a quarter inch you have to be very close to the metal to get a good cut uh, so at that time we just did small pieces just maybe like one square foot pieces of metal that were cutting one by one so it was easy to keep the height adjusted properly just by leveling the metal workpiece now if the metal workpiece is a big sheet say that weighs 640 pounds 
you can't do that you have to move the torch you have to adjust the torch throughout that whole metal piece so that's the idea there height control is the main thing that's missing for us we know how to do motion uh, so if we go back to the document motion we have so uh, what we want to do this time around is use our universal axis uh, using bigger shafts to do a CNC torch table. So instead of using the five the five sixteenths shafts or eight millimeter, we use much bigger shafts, about one inch, twenty five millimeter shafts, so that we can support a much larger, much larger device. Going on to slide two, so we have the universal axis. We do have the one inch pr printed piece design. This is uh, Oliver's replication there with a 5 six, inch but we do have the one inch printed pieces and we actually printed some of those out it appears to be working we never put together an axis using the one inch pieces but um, that's what we can do so prior work also involves the capacitive height control circuit uh, we actually designed one and have that going but we never got it all up and running uh, there's a lot of prior work on that we have a full design of the capacitive control circuit you can read more about that and uh, we have never run automatic gas control on that but basically if you have a CNC torch we're talking we're not talking about plasma we're talking about the simplest minimum viable product so I have slide number three here as far as what that minimum viable product is that means using something that's accessible in low resource environments or the advanced world but what does that mean so don't need a plasma cutter if you've got a torch handle that's enough the the idea here is actually to use oxy fuel which is widely accessible you already people already use or we already use oxy oxy acetylene so the, the question here is just don't without getting a plasma cutter just use oxy fuel and uh, modify the torch handle Slight, slight modification on the torch handle allows you to use the same gas system that you already have in the shop. So this is once again thinking about the minimal part count and the whole Global Village construction set as a system where you have the absolute minimum uh, without going into specialized tools, like w without going into a specialized torch handle. Because typically when you do a CNC torch table, you, you use a specialized three-hose torch, which has automatic gas control on that. But here we can... We can uh, hack a regular torch handle so point here to the, on the design requirements here it's not three hose oh wait let me share my screen so you guys know what I'm talking about here um, so you can look at look at one point to I'm in a document uh, so look at this can you guys see that uh, so I'm pointing to this part here let's see can you guys see it? yeah it looks like you can see it so it uses a standard torch handle we don't need to go with a special three hose uh, torch handle which is just another piece it will cost you like you know at least a hundred more dollars for just the the torch the handle part the metal part uh, no need for that just more parts more tips you know it uses different torch tips and like just a bunch of different parts that you don't need so we can do simpler uh, and for now the minimum product is just use a bunch of our very tiny uh, NEMA 17 motors so if we use a larger axis we can do multiple very small motors like they're each about a hundred inch ounce um, but it's it's sufficient and we want to explore what the limits are for multiplying those uh, very small stepper motors so for example if you look at this design here we can have a stepper motor one on each side like if you have this design of a gantry this is showing more of like a like a router but if we have this kind of a design then we can put a stepper motor here, there, there, and there in the four corners. So you can have plenty of force. And then still use the tiny six millimeter be belt. You only need a, you know, like 10 pounds of force to pull this stuff around. It's non-contact. For a router that might not do, for torch it's acceptable. So we can do similar here on the, the, the x-axis, which is the short axis here. You can put one, two, three, four... Uh, stepper motors so you have plenty of power and for the Z you can do like like two stepper motors or even one this this symmetric design is a nice one and symmetry is always good in design but anyway uh, don't need to go to bigger motors NEMA 17 would do for now 
Okay, next point. So we're working on a ramps controlled. So ramps the same driver board, but using external stepper driver. So that's what Chaz is working on. He's he's putting together a system using larger external drivers. And then eventually you want to go to. Well, let, let's let me look at this. Um, the the phases of development. So to get a basic table working, you need you need these four things. So standard torch handle, NEMA 17 motors with one inch one inch. A universal axis, larger stepper motor controller, capacitive sensor. So that's like I'm gonna emphasize the capacitive sensor. That's kind of like a lot of what the work has to, the future work that we need to do, make that thing work. So we've got the design, we got to make it work. So I'm gonna emphasize that. So with that, you get full motion with capacitive sensor, meaning that you're you're following the metal, following the height of the metal on the on a on a CNC torch table. And the relevance of the CNC torch table to back up a slightly, we're going to be doing a lot of tracks for the bulldozer or the, or the larger tractor. We're going to make track tractors this year. We're probably going to build at least two. Um, so I can tell you from last year's experience, or this was two years ago actually, we cut a lot of that by hand last uh, two years ago. It's just getting to really like impossible. It's too much cutting. So the CNC would really help on making tracks and other parts. So very important and then of course to for the first time to start manufacturing our brick presses and tractors using all in-house torch cutting which we typically we have outsourced that to date since our torch table wasn't really up to up to full speed but full motion with capacitive sensor gets us a very important piece the, the capacitive sensor makes that a complete system there and initially what we can do I'm thinking we can do if we use a regular torch handle a regular torch handle you depress the torch to to do the cutting gas what i'm thinking for that right now and, and we should definitely try this we've got our universal axis that can serve as a small actuator make a tiny universal axis a few inches long using our small um nema 17 stepper motor make a little actuator that moves back and forth to actually hit the lever manually so attach a small universal axis that functions not for motion control like XYZ motion but more just to bump something and that something is our lever that we bump to turn on the cutting gas so that's what I'd like to do that's um, that allows us to use the non-specialized uh, torch table handle in other words, using a standard oxy fuel torch handle, we can make that work on a CNC torch table. So that's that that's a that's a subtlety there, but but it's important because we're not introducing any parts into the system using existing existing torch handles. Uh, now we are going to have to modify that a little bit because the torch handle typically is like at a 90 degree. We have to do either like a straight torch handle that because the way it works is the torch handle is going to hang, hang up and down so it needs to be the tip has to face down so to do that we either get like a tip that faces down already or we bend those metal hoses at the end of the um, a standard hose 90 degrees so that the tip is actually facing down so there's a little bit of hacking there but just basically making the plumbing work such that the geometry of the torch faces downwards okay but after that after we do this manual thing um, we can do auto gas actuation, and that would be um, that's more advanced. We don't have to worry about that, but but definitely down the road we want to have a full working system where you have auto gas actuation, auto ignition, a water table. What's a water table? It's a table where the metal actually rests on a pond of water. You could do that, or constantly drip water on top of the metal. The idea there is when the metal gets hot under cutting, it's going to start to warp. So you just get higher cut quality when the metal is on a water table. This is basically a, a pond, basically the surface right under the metal where the metal is sitting. That's just the water table. It's got water there. It's filled with water. Keeps the metal cool. The torch can cut into the water. Splashes a little bit, but it keeps the metal, metal really straight. And now we can talk about the next steps. But a capacitive height sensor is the industry standard right now. The more advanced way is to do an ultrasound sensor which uses ultrasound which does not get bothered by smoke or dirt 
or whatever smoke it's a smoky environment so you can't use light like a late like a laser or a light uh, light detector for the height sensing too much smoke but an ultrasound sensor does not mind the smoke but it's a little higher tech that's the industry that's like the most advanced industry standard um, people say I, I talked to the guys that make that they, they talked they told me the manufacturer told me that that's the most advanced thing over capacitive sensing it's more accurate and so forth but it's also higher tech so we don't have that technology in front of us so it will require a little more work and we should probably do that afterwards as the next step so basically if you talk about a minimum viable product the, the capacitive sensing is very well proven and easier to do especially because we already have that circuit for that and we have to make it work so that's that and and then also on the bottom here if you look at this uh, the bottom just making sure you guys are looking um, down the road we want to create also open source stepper drivers the stepper drivers that we're using are just off-the-shelf standard parts they're eight dollar parts they're not too expensive but an open source stepper driver would be good right now the Pololu the little tiny ones on the ramps controller they're open source but they're tiny they're, they don't have enough current capacity so we want to open source eventually just design a, a larger stepper driver uh, that would be a good thing because I don't really know of any single stepper driver that's open source the actual stepper driver part that's open source that's more than like two amps you want to talk about five or ten amps for driving multiple stepper motors or very large stepper motors so the ones we got are four amp the large external ones uh, so down the road also we want to use the same motion system with larger stepper motors right here larger belts gear reduction now note that all of this uses the universal access system that's because we're maxing out what's possible with the belt driven universal axis I think we can use he much heavier belts and much heavier drive to get up to precision CNC machining like making engines and things uh, I think that's possible instead of using gears ball screws or Acme you can do belt I know there's machines that work on belts that are heavy-duty CNC machines so the idea here is we're maxing out the capacity actually engineering what's the most we can do with the very simple humble universal axis like you see here that Oliver has replicated this very thing because you can enlarge the rods as much as you want you can b print the 3d printed pieces as large as you want so for the heavy-duty stuff we're talking about two inch rods 50 millimeter rods huge that gets you uh, when you do the calculations that gets you something like a half a uh, on a 4x4 four four bed using just a single one of these with two inch rods it gets you I, I was calculating that uh, the, the the beam deflection there is like half a thousandth of an inch so that's plenty of precision for heavy-duty precision machining so anyway the limits to this are pretty much to be determined that's what we're going after here so getting into the the torch height controllers there's ones that come off the shelf that you can buy the systems that's the capacitive ring it's the thing that floats next to the the metal surface and detects the so basically you're measuring capacitance through a circuit and based on the capacitance the, the capacitance corresponds to the distance of the ring from the metal that gets you a height through a conversion of capacitance you have to convert the capacitance signal to a digital signal and then you have to do some lo basic logic saying if the capacitance increases then move the torch up because you're too close if the capacitor capacitance is low is lower you got to get closer to the table because you're, you're too far away from the table so that's the basic working so what's the development approach here call up manufacturers maybe get some 87747 that's so that's the system if you look at the, um, the capacitive high control circuit by Paul Neelands that's from a few years ago uh, that's what it uses it uses this capacitive chip um, that's what's used there but the game czars here man um, we got Chaz working on the as far as the stuff here Chaz is doing the stepper larger stepper motor controller we should check in on that maybe let's use this document here to kind of organize 
all that we are, all that's happening on a CNC torch table. Uh, this document here is supposedly the height controller, but we can put in all our work on a torch table. So please, guys, use this. So, for example, let's let's check in with Chaz. Uh, where are you at on your your progress in um, in a larger electronics? It's essentially taking the ramps controller and putting larger stepper drivers on that. Chaz. So far, I got there. Do we know what the ramps? Like I said before, connected. Uh huh. Um, I bought the wiring for the power supply. This thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let me uh turn off my. Let's see if I can see. It. Are you showing something? Cause I I'm not seeing you. Yeah, I'm showing like the different pieces that I got. Okay, there. Yep. And I've got like the stepper, micro step driver, and I gotta figure out the wiring. Um. So right now I'm kind of looking at the documentation, um, and for the drive the motors that I have, there's like six wires instead of four. Yeah. So I've been referencing. Um, gotta find the document. Um, the D3D controller. Yeah. You mean the plug yeah, is? Like four, one, one. Yeah, the plug has got that? four. Does the plug have four wires or four terminals or six? It's got six wires uh, on the it. The plug. For my uh, motors, there's six uh, wires. Six wires, okay. Yeah, you gotta, yeah, you gotta just like either take out or connect a couple of them together. I think, I think that's still. Um, let's see, where's the bill of materials that you actually ordered? Do you have that somewhere on your log or somewhere, like the actual parts you ordered? Um, I added references on one of the on the universal controller log. Uh, where's where's that? Put a link in a chat box. You mean universal control controller? We got a log on that. Let's see. Is that this here? Do we got a log on that? Nope. If you can type in the link, that would be good. Let's see where we are. Um. You're talking about the page called the Universal Controller? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Let's see, so you got those ones, is that what you're talking about? So this... Is this what, exactly what you got? I found the link. I found the link. Okay. Alright, so we got... Uh, oh yeah, so that's the document in there. Uh, for everybody to see. So that's what's going on there. Yeah, that's on the CNC controller. So we can link to that in our working document here. So, so I'm going to just put a link right in the work doc. I'll share my screen again so that people can see where I'm working. Yeah, so I put that I put that link right in here, so that we kind of all know where stuff is here. Yeah, so there's that link right there, and okay, so we've got the bill of materials right there. So if we look at those, for example, for the the stepper motors, like if I click on that. I think those, yeah, we can troubleshoot that by, uh, yeah, have you been looking at how to wire that up, or are you having trouble on that, or? I'm having a little bit of trouble on that. I'm looking at the, let me find the document I'm looking at. I was looking at the ramps wiring. Uh, here's the link. Yeah. So you got the D3D controller page. Um, yeah, so that's the wiring for the the D3D. And right, so there's wiring diagram here. So you got a question like what, like page three or something? Yeah, I'm on page three. Yeah. Because there's like four um, wires. Yeah. So right now you need to to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you're gonna have to figure out, Google that online, how to convert a, like the six wire to four wire. You, you can do that, those, because those have six. Um, Google that, you should be able to find that. It shouldn't be a problem. Because uh, I know okay. that the ones with six wires, you can just uh, reconnect them up, I believe. I'm not wrong on that. Okay, so let's see. So, yeah, so continue working on that. See, I mean, if you, uh, you know, do, uh, yeah, I guess for troubleshooting that, uh, document how you're doing that. So, so yeah, keep that, keep track of that on the log. Like, for example, we got rewired the six wire to the four wire so we can know that from your log the next time and stuff like that for this particular. Okay. Uh, so keep working on that. What you need is uh, so you got the you got the wires to connect the power supply to the RAM port because you gotta con connect the power supply, then connect to the 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 stepper motor, and then you're gonna need to uh, take off one of those little. So do you know about that? Those so those little little Pololu stepper drivers. You're gonna take off the one from the X, and then wire into whatever pins are necessary. You're gonna wire that that's uh, the big stepper driver into that have you gotten into looking in any of that not really um, I don't okay. have any blow drivers no on my ramps right so you just I need know. to yeah you just need to figure out the pinout so so Google that the pinout of the ramps like what all the pins stand for and then connect the corresponding the correct pins to the larger stepper driver so it's I think you're gonna need is it two or four like step step and direction I don't know it might be just two pins that go to the larger stepper controller you're gonna have to find those I, I'm not familiar with that I haven't done it so just a little research on that um, okay. but you can google how people have used larger stepper controllers with ramps so that's that should be easy to find because um, I know people have done that the, the thing we know is that People have taken a little ramps board and put instead of the the Pololu drivers, they put they plugged in much larger drivers. Now, okay, okay. So as far as the four wires, they're no longer gonna plug. I don't believe they're gonna plug into the board anymore. You you're probably gonna have those wires plug into. I think the way it works is the the four wires that we're showing here, those are probably gonna plug into instead of your stepper. The stepper is gonna plug into the uh the yeah 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 forget about those four they don't connect here anymore they're going to connect to the big the stepper motor is going to connect to the big stepper driver and all that's going to come here is the wires from the some of the pins of the pololu to your larger stepper driver but once again detail devils in the details um look that up yeah okay so okay let's move move right on to the other guys so so as far as oliver and uh, Abraham, I want to ask you guys now how much you guys have ever looked into torch tables and, and so forth and whether you'd be equipped to actually start researching the actual wiring and, and prototyping of the, <clears throat> the height controller. Because for example, Oliver, like if you make yourself the axis, like the universal axis, if you 3D print that, you can pretty much test the height control circuit but we need to source the ring and make the electronics happen so we need to start that development process that's that's the thing that needs to happen there but um abraham and and oliver um what are your thoughts on how you guys can contribute abraham is this completely new to you I was working until now today with the auto leveling, but I was doing it in the PCB milling. Yeah. And it's totally different yeah. than this one that you, are, that you are that you propose. But I don't know about the torch. I was using the MTC and C, and I was I was thinking upload up, upgrade to plasma now, but not experience yet. I have not. Sorry. So you have actually worked with. Um with a torch? Uh, no, I haven't tested yet. Uh -huh. I haven't worked with it. I don't yeah. Have right. So the next steps are to... Right. The next steps are to... 
Uh, probably what we want to do is use the circuit that we have drawn up and make that work. So basically study that. Um, have you seen the, the, the work before that Paul has, has done that's on the wiki? The one I linked to right here, the capacitive high control circuit by Paul Neelands. Yeah, um, maybe if you could mute yourself for a second. Um, so there's the link here in the working document. Uh, where are we here? This link right here. So that shows the design and what we probably want to do is look into that carefully, see if we can study it and make it work. Um, wrong link, oh sorry. Let me put the correct link in there. So Paul, here, here's Paul log that's from 2013, but we've got documentation on the height controller there. So let me put in the correct link there. Yeah. So as far as that link goes, you can read all about the work that we have done before. So, so the next step is for the torch torch team to come up with that and I think that's all we can do I mean that there's a lot of work right there so see if we can study it and actually come up with a clear path of, of uh, prototyping that so what I would suggest is we print ourselves or make ourselves the axis and I lost connection here yeah sorry guys uh, so Jitsi appears a little more unstable than Google Docs there. But the next step would be to let's study as far as the people who are directly related um, to the CNC torch table work. Let's study the work on the height controller from before and move right into defining a clear prototyping path for that. So that's the main task. Like. This would be an independent system from the XY motion. What we can do, that's think of it as completely independent from XY. The XY control, we got the tool path going on, and independently from that, using a separate Arduino, we would do the Z control. So that's basically running independently, just sensing and moving the Z up and down as needed, completely independent from the XY motion. So it's a nice thing to prototype. It's a, it's a self-contained unit that lends itself to prototyping uh, on a small scale like without having to build the full table what you can do is if you can uh, get your hands on the universal axis then you can use the ramps controller for motion and then you can add the the Z control on top of that as an independent system so that's the next thing but what we should do is kind of study this up and figure out more clarity in this working document as far as how exactly we want to go about doing that and what are the missing pieces from the documentation already. I know we have that small control circuit somewhere here and I can contact the guy who's worked on that before. Uh, so those little circuit boards, I have those, I have at least one of those here and we can either do that or or wire ourselves up on a prototyping board uh, one of these the circuits as well but we already have the small board so so we should we should use that it's probably the most effective way to do it unless we want to modify the circuit for any other purposes but first thing is to understand the circuit and see how it integrates with the rest of the control system so we should probably start drawing up some design documents and how you know what do you connect where and how you test so basically a testing procedure for that and we can work with so we need to to make ourselves a capacitive ring or buy one off the shelf and then go from there so we should look at what exactly are the is the bill of materials uh, that we need so probably a step on that there would be a prototyping plan and bill of materials So we need to come up with a plan right there. So 
Uh, can you guys work work on that, looking into that, uh, analyzing what we have already and proposing, maybe come up with a proposal for how exactly we do that, assuming that there's three of us um, that can be working on it. Uh, Abraham, do you have a capacity to do some 3D printing where you are? You got a 3D printer, correct? Yeah, printer, correct. Yes, it is not too much filament. I, am, I have limits with the budget. Money. Yeah. Okay. And maybe we can we can send you some materials or something. Um, yeah. Maybe probably a good thing would be if we can. Yeah. I mean, w one way to do it is just basically ship you the stuff that we have and maybe the supplies, so we can actually do the work. If you can actually commit to the time of doing that, so we can maybe discuss that offline later. How exactly we'd want to do it, but that would be definitely definitely feasible to do that. Yeah. So I think we should come up with a concrete plan and then talk about how we execute on that, meaning, you know, who does the actual work, who's who's going to be doing the, the prototyping. So between Oliver and, and yourself. Um, Oliver, do you have any comments at this point? Because for now we should basically study what we have and see how, see what we want to decide from here. Oliver, you want to chat, do a thing in the chat box? Okay, so so we should probably get moving on to the uh, the next item. So we, so we kind of more or less started on the CNC torch table. The idea there is, I mean, we want to prototype this. So for August, so August we're going to do a lot of builds. Uh, that's our prime time for doing a lot of building. Um, August, so we've got a couple of months to prototype, but it, it would be good to see if we can have the the height control worked out in the next few weeks, next couple of weeks, um, so that at the same time we can 3D print the much larger frame, or even use the existing smaller smaller frames just for testing of the height controller. But we want to get that prototyping within the next few weeks and actually build it out here, here or remotely. Um, the best thing to do would be to get a very specific uh, build and, and test procedure so that we can possibly even do that in multiple locations and people start working on, on their system because it's, it's relatively low cost. Like if you have a, one has access to the NEMA 17 motors, some 3D printing, um, the build materials cost there is not too much. If you've, if you've got your, your ramps board, an Arduino, and then some plastic and some metal rods and a stepper motor. So that those are all the parts that uh, typically uh, are quite accessible, and um, not it's not too expensive to to prototype it. So we'll see how we can do that. Okay, um, so let's continue on to. We want to move on to, yeah. So is that is that all right for for now, guys? Um, study up on um, what we have for the height controller, and then move on from there and work so please work in this in the cnc torch table height controller document just whatever notes you've got um you know start pages you know you're able to edit that um slide new slide so so the conclusion slide is um examine paul's work examine paul's prior art and then come up with a prototyping plan yeah so let's continue basically using this document continue continue um, working in there and then continue communicating within uh, the 3d printer working group on minds open source ecology sorry on uh, network that open source ecology .org. so let's continue on email and uh, in this document so I think that's good for now let's uh continue here so let's see do we have abe back on yeah i think so right because we need abe to get us through where we are so we got abe we got two abes showing up there um abe and dixon i guess for the next part so you guys all right any other questions for now okay Let's move on to the the filament maker. So uh, Abe, uh, let's uh, let's talk here. So the document that we have on the filament maker, 
I'm gonna go to so moving out of the universal controller out of the the torch table into the I'm gonna go to a blog and look at the there's a visual build materials that we've come up with for uh, let's see where we are so the working document here is I believe this one let's see no no not that Abe, hey, you want to put paste that link into for everybody? Okay, can you hear me? It's the uh, Lyman extruder file. Okay, let's see. So the page on the wiki is um, we got Lyman film and extruder, and the working document there. That's I guess that's the correct working document. I believe right here. Yeah. So we've got the page called Lyman film and extruder, and on it we've got. Uh, work based on the existing live and filament extruder a lot of work has been done there the guys using these to make uh, filament out of ABS on a regular basis I'm gonna go into edit the the working document so the working document let's paste that in okay for anyone else looking at that there's the working document in the text box. Is that working there? Did that show up for you guys? Okay, we got Joseph and Abe and and. Uh, Dixon as far as relevant for this this project here the idea is that we're documenting so can you guys um, uh, can you guys see the doc I, this is Dixon I can see it okay there we go so we've been basically going through the the instructions that were provided on the if you go to the there's a wiki link there for the the working page so if you want to click on it open that up but there's a there's an instructional document that we're pretty much going through uh, open that up on the bottom of the Lyman filament extruder wiki page under links and if you open up there's um, the file Lyman v6 zip that's going to get you the full instructions on the filament maker so that zip file also has a pdf file that has uh, that's nine megabytes you can see the instructionals there for what exists as far as the overall build process and we've started this Lyman filament extruder v6 document working doc to summarize all that's within the other docs so we're kind of getting ready okay visual bill of materials kind of trying to piece it all together but it's essentially um, if you can kind of understand let's see it's really no great overview slide here what we should probably start with is this new slide that talks about the the over like just the basic systems diagram so that we typically want to start with uh, overall system so we know all the main parts that go into it uh, yeah so is there a was there a comprehensive document within um, the instructional there or no not really I'm opening up the the instructions right now Yep. Okay, I was having some trouble with the GPT, I think. Um, the zip files have PDFs in the folder that's, uh, I guess it's the main files folder in those zip yeah. files, and they have PDFs in there. Yeah, there's a construction manual PDF within the files folder. So if you open that up, which I'm, I'm opening up, let me maybe share my screen here so you can see where I'm looking. Okay, sharing sharing my screen, uh, but this is the document. So, uh, what's what's nice to see is um, 
Yeah, I mean the first picture is not too bad of a of an idea here, but basically what he's got is he's got a I mean this is kind of like the most comprehensive picture here, but you've got um a motor driving an auger and here's the hopper where you put in the pellets and then there's the hot tube here that spits out your filament now Abe is that the one that's wall mounted is that correct the one showing here the one that he has is wall mounted that's the horizontal yep. configuration shown the, well the one above it there is the wall mount yeah the wall, and the wall that's mount. the recommended version for now right or does he recommend the flat mounted as well uh, can you repeat that is does he recommend the wall mounted version or the flat mounted version I think that he, they're mostly the same but I okay. think he likes prefers the wall mounted I, there yeah. isn't much difference other than the plastic part and the position yeah. so. yep so basically what you see there, it's uh, that the tube there, that's a hopper full of uh, plastic material. It goes into the, through that red bend into the, basically the, the heat zone here. And there's a little heater element and then you're just spitting out plastic. So, so you got melting going on here. And Abe, hey, what is the control system here? So you turn the thing on, it turns on the heat, and then basically the material starts falling out the bottom simply by melting there is no well i mean there's the auger that's pushing it out the the heater plus the auger the auger is pushing it out and do we control the speed of the auger here there's different versions uh and i think that he found that he preferred the one without the fan and the voltage regulator and the motor speed control i think that he suggested that the control of just the heat using the uh, relay was enough. The PID controls the heat and the motor once you, I guess mm -hmm. you have to heat it up first I'm sure. It's yeah. Plastic and you let it heat up or the PID I think has an alarm it tells you when it's hot and then you just manually yeah. switch on the motor I think that's the way he has it wired. Once it's hot enough it can start extruding. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, so we're essentially saying we set the temperature to a specific value and then we're just extruding by turning on the motor and that's it for the, for the extruder side, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we have and then from the extruder then we've got, let's see, uh, so a bunch of 3D printed parts, like he's 3D printing a lot of the components for this. Um, Let's see, so so this is the electronics, main electronics thing. So let's take a look at this. That's that's pretty decent. So you got a 24 volt power supply, you got your gear motor, you got your temperature controller here, motor switch that just basically turns the motor on and off. You got a heat switch, turns the heat on and off, voltage regulator, solid state relay. The solid state relay is just to turn on the heater. Yes, the relay is controlled by the temperature controller, the PID. Yeah. And then that voltage regulator, I think he's mostly eliminated the voltage regulator because uh -huh. he uses that more for the controlled motor version. Now, I, I thought about it, maybe, I don't know much about the printing of the, or extruding the plastics, temperature stuff, the, there might be different types of plastics that might need more precise thermal control and we'd want to have some of those extra things that he's yeah. doing. But, uh, yeah. So, so there that is, you got the heat band around the barrel and an auger bit. The auger bit is just a simple drill bit, like a wood drill bit. So there we go, we go, we go um, so he puts it all together. Uh, there's some mechanical stuff of how you attach the barrel and so forth. Um, you have to attach the gear motor. Uh, and what kind of coupler does he use? He uses a 3D printed coupler. Uh, does he say that there's any issues with the 3D printed coupler or that works pretty well? I think that the plastic parts, he seemed to suggest they were okay. Yeah. He didn't detail a lot of issues with that. I mean, th this is the latest version he has of it. Yeah. He has different variations and versions on uh, stuff, even in these documents. Okay. But yeah. it looks like it works okay. He's 
got like a block of MDF insulating heat from the plastic where it's needed. Um, there's some complexity with the parts. It looks like the um, fabrication, if we could change that, it would be better because he's drilling holes in that flange. I think just because the existing holes in the flange are too big. Uh, drilling holes in the flange, the metal flange holding the... Oh, yeah. So, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. where you screw the... Pipe. Yeah. Yeah, that's not too bad. I mean, that's just a drill press. Uh, right? Yeah, there's you're, a couple of things I think uh, a drill press... Yeah. For so you're, you're saying, drill. okay, well... Like it'll be best at best you're just using existing holes in there, but yeah, they're they're just a little too large and, and thing. So that's yeah, not I don't know not if we bad. Could adapt it with other parts. Yeah. If we're trying to put washers and stuff that would just add more parts. So. Right, and that's so that looks pretty simple. You got pipe, you got a, yourself an auger, you got standard parts, but you got to drill the the flange through. Um, 3D printed parts, 3D printed coupler. And then I guess a thermistor. What's that happening there? Is, no, that is that power or a thermistor or something? Is uh, the K-type thermocouple is the thermistor for monitoring temperature. It connects back to that PID yeah. to monitor the temperature control. There you go. So then he kind of bonds it together. Heat band. Um, yeah, I mean this is relatively simple. Uh, so then you got this coming together. What the ring there? What's that doing? The it's ring and the extra stuff around the ring. He's got oh the ring in front with the, yeah. the plastics extruding through. Yeah. I think that was just as a fan holder. Okay. And he removed the fan, so it just happens to be going through the ring in that picture. Okay. It might be handy for that. Yeah. So there we go with that. Now the spool winder. Uh, that's now getting a little tricky, but the way I understand this here, so you got the filament going through uh, this little thing where you're, so you're pulling the filament, you're, you're driving the, the roller or like the reel, you reel it in once there's enough coming out, like once the, basically the, the wire, the filament drops, it hits this limit switch. And then you you engage the puller, and then once once the puller makes the, pulls the filament enough to the top, it hits another limit switch. So you're basically bouncing back and forth between two switches. And is that is that essentially the the mechanism there, Abe? Yeah, it's just two limit switches. Yeah. The system as a whole seems a little more complicated because he has two motors. He has a polar motor, and then he has another motor for the winder. Mm -hmm. Kind of seems like maybe. Some of that stuff eventually could be combined together in one microcontroller or something, and then if mm -hmm. you monitor the speed enough, then you would need some of those extra parts, maybe just one winder motor. But yeah, yeah, and I guess he, you know, the way he had that all electronic before he had speed controls, but now he just went to to the much simpler system and I think it's probably a good idea to get familiarity with this very simple system on off kind of a system and then go more advanced as we need later so yeah, yeah I think that's a that's it's a good simple. idea and and yeah I mean I agree with you it's not a big deal to use a microcontroller that just monitors everything and you're turning on you know like if yeah I'm not sure how you would go how you would monitor the like without this simple device like I'm not sure what's a clear way to get like variable uh, yeah, winding control, yeah because yeah, I mean that's elegant and simple if it works that's good right and he says that the, the quality of the the filament that he gets is very good like plus minus 0 0.05 millimeter which is quite good uh, but what's he say about okay so for example this controller here what's he doing this variable voltage controller uh, spool speed. He's so you're saying that's one option, but in another way, he just says get rid of that and just have on and off. Not on that. I think he's using that. That's the polar. Okay. And it it he's got two of those voltage regulators, and one is op operating that small motor that pulls the wire, and then there's another controller. Oh, okay. For the winder motor as well. 
Okay, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got, let's back up here. So in this picture here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so in this picture here, yeah, I forgot about that. So the control of the of the filament thickness, where does that occur? Does it occur? I didn't think that he was pulling it to get the thickness. He didn't really describe that. I thought that the thickness was based on, or the diameter of the plastic was based on the borehole in the brass uh, end cap that he's using for the extrusion point. But I guess, I don't, I don't know that much about the no, plastics man. and temperature part of it. Obviously, it's going to stretch a little if it's still hot. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, what we're seeing there, what I'm smelling there is that's going to be super tricky to get to work right if if there's uh, no more direct way to control the thickness. Because I would imagine that you would pull it... Uh, I know I've been, you know, what I've seen on the internet, you pull it to determine the thickness. How fast you pull it means how thick or thin you stretch it out. So if you don't have that stretching capacity there, that seems to me like, wow, yeah, it's going to be a tricky deal to get it to the exact uh, right width. But tell me more about this. So why do you need the puller? Is the puller operating at different pulling speeds? The puller, as far as I can tell, the controls on it, he just sets it by the voltage on these voltage regulators here from the power supply, and I think they're both operating it. He says he sets them both at six volts, and I think it's a 12 volt power supply, so I don't know if they're in mm -hmm. kind of parallel or something, but the um, mm -hmm. it does look like he has that filament under tension there between the puller and the winder, but I assume mm -hmm. some of that was for just keeping the winding straight, and yeah. he has a nice winder option device but he says that it's unnecessary uh -huh. to keep the spool winding neat. Of course I don't know if that'd be, you know, an issue of tangling with your spools. Yeah. That's a real problem on printers because I, I don't know if that's yeah. experience with three D printing. Yeah, so what what it appears that to be there that yeah the puller and the spooler, so there's the pooling there and the spooling, they're just there to keep everything straight, but they're not contributing to the thickness. Right? Yeah, I didn't see anything in the wow. documents about that aspect yeah. of it. Um, and maybe, maybe the reason he has those limit switches hanging down by gravity, he's yeah. just kind of figured that out to be good enough. Right. Uh, so he's pretty much light. relying on a temperature and gravity to get you the right thickness, which is like, that yeah. sounds to me like, wow, to get that set that can vary from day to day depending on the weather. <laughs> uh, yeah, he probably has a, a nice temperature controlled shop up there in Washington where it's cool, Probably. It, that PID controlling the heat band should be pretty precise. I mean, yeah. The, the thermocouple and he keeps that whole system fairly insulated with a piece of welding blanket. So yeah. I, there may be pretty good accuracy on the yeah. temperature control to the heat band. And, those solid state relays are pretty fast, I guess. So yeah. I guess it, maybe it pulses it. If it's yeah. PDO, it, I, I yeah. No, I wouldn't question the temperature being accurate there, but as soon as it enters the air, I guess uh, I'm concerned about how it stretches at that point, assuming that there's some stretching, or maybe it's all done through the orifice. Maybe the orifice is a huge part. Because I'm thinking that the orifice is just kind of like approximate what's the orifice from the through the um, cap let's see i have a document i believe it says that it's a 16th inch which i thought or he bores it with a 16th inch bit that's three millimeters and, about yeah he was or what, maybe that was the whole 16 no no one sixteenth. that's no that's 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 like two right. millimeter yeah. it's a cut one okay so that's yeah, smaller than hmm that brass plug, that's one thing that I, I didn't find details on was um, yeah. how he bored that. He doesn't really yeah. discuss the bore. And I assume, well, I was thinking at first, the way it's put together, you could easily change the size. Um, yeah. You could just swap out the brass plugs, have different sizes of bore holes. Yeah. 
but it will the way it's put together and wrapped up it's kind of hard to change that but not super difficult i guess yeah 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 so what i'm seeing here is that yeah it's probably going to be tricky to get it to the exact right thickness uh that's going to be a little bit of messing around but then I'm thinking like for the future, oh right, how do we end up controlling that? So some kind of a puller mechanism that depending on how, fa how fast you're pulling, the accuracy is going to be determined by that. Um, yeah, yeah, so it seems... seems. Um... So for example here, film and cooling on the floor as it's extruded, 20 to 25 inches per minute, tolerance of plus minus 0 0.06 millimeter. I mean, that's pretty pretty decent as far as the accuracy um yeah 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 but um yeah we gotta try it i mean this is not not too bad in terms of uh and you know, the machine is pretty simple as far as that goes but the question is how do we perfect it at the end of the day or yeah we'll see we'll see yeah the simplicity overall is is nice on all the parts i mean there's a few extra parts but it, mm -hmm. it's kind of more fault tolerant than yeah the limit switches uh, yeah electronics how does he 3d print the big the very oh hold on let me let me just uh, take this call real quick okay. uh, yeah Oh, sorry guys so my next question was on the green part how does he print that that looks like a relatively large part how does he print that multiple pieces hey are you there, you there still Abe can't hear you hello yeah okay so I was muted uh, the plastic parts are in pieces and he glues them together with ABS. A uh -huh. lot of the larger plastic parts are, are glued together with ABS solvent. Uh -huh. There's uh, some photos of that in the uh, PDF construction oh, okay. manual. Alright, that works if you could just use crazy glue. Yeah. Some of them are also bolted together by heating brass inserts into the plastic and then putting M4 bolts through. Yeah. Uh, I think that top part, the extruder part, is, is bolted through to the uh, larger case, the plastic case with the power supply inside that. Yeah, we should see if we could get those files, these 3D CAD files from him. If he has those in step, that would be good. Yeah, I haven't found files. I kept looking on Thingiverse, and I need to look back again and see if he updated some of the files. It sounded like he, he changed he changed the um, the licensing before he may have updated uh, some information there. Yep, and he changed the license to the right license. That's good. So we have a nice blown out part diagram. Yeah, I mean this is good. It's just all stock pieces and little drilling, uh, quite easy, three D printed and stock pieces. So that's that's good. Um, you know we yeah, should. Mm -hmm. he has he has some uh, plastic uh, printouts for uh, 
hole drilling templates. Some of the plastic pieces, there's excellent templates for boring the holes in the flange as well as in that MDF block. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have a 3D printer? I do not. You should come down here and get one. I can get you one of ours. Uh, do, are you interested in doing that? I'm interested in 3D printing. It's probably difficult for me to get all the way down there during the summer here, but okay. at some point I'm planning to come up there and see. Okay. We might... um. If we ship one to you, you could. Can you work it? Can you do this? Like, uh, print it out. I think so. Um, I have to find some space here to set that stuff up, but uh, mm -hmm. um, I should be able to figure out a way to um, place to put it and print everything. Yeah. Yeah. So look. Yeah. That. I've got. I've got a lot to learn about the 3D printing. I, I yeah. Yeah. I mean, for us on our side, we're, we're going to get our print army going here. Um, so that's kind of like over the next week or two, just start getting the clus print cluster going and perfect the prints. So we haven't perfected the prints yet. We got to get all the settings right. But yeah, that's that's where we are right here. Um, yeah, no, that's good. So what are our next steps on this? So so the whole design. Yeah, I mean, this all the 3D printed pieces are there. Um, there's the actual wiring. So he so he does have that variable voltage um do are the is this diagram clear enough to you he has two different wiring diagrams for different uh versions yeah read about it he has one i think with the variable motor speed and the voltage regulator and then one without yeah some of the extras right it's one of those things where you've got options and you as a result you don't know what to do or what works better that's yeah, part of the I, yeah. It's probably good to test everything. I mean, there might be. I'm not familiar with the 3D plastics, but I assume that if we start working with different types of plastics, people might want the options, or they might need more thermal control for different types of plastics, and uh, might have more control of the cooling, or if it needs to stretch more, or something. If people want to get different options on the sizing or the types of plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So what are our next steps here? So the idea is, um, I mean, instructions are kind of decent, but I mean, well, I think the next step would be is to to pick a very specific, like basically flesh out some of the details. Like he's got, you know, he's got a lot of work here, but the idea would be to get very specific on step-by-step. -step. So he shows a bunch of pictures, but I think probably to flesh it out with more detail would be a good idea and wherever he has a choice say okay we're not gonna do that we're gonna do this now you know um, yeah. so that would be because we can only do one thing at a there's, time yeah there's quite a bit of instruction there on some things and yeah other things there was a documentation and I just had to think about it for a while yeah to figure some of that out I've made notes on some of those things it took me a while to figure out why he was drilling holes in the uh, black iron nipple pipe and best I can figure it's, it's air release holes I thought it was uh, wouldn't that be for the thermistor or no for the what thermistor for the thermocouple or no oh um, so I see the thermos sister is attached right at the end underneath the heat band Mm -hmm. and taped on was kept on tape okay so not like. bad so and then it's wrapped up so the holes are drilled in the pipe that i was talking about near the flange and so i think as the plastic is pushed through it starts to melt it's he's using uh pellets so it needs to somewhere to push out air so you're not oh, okay. you know, pushing air through the, uh, through the end oh, okay a little detail like that yeah a little airlock yeah. Um, did you find the bill of materials to be pretty accurate? Or you think it's missing? It's pretty good. Um, the, there was a little, the, the one on the extruder was a little bit better than the one on the winder. I'm having a little 
double check and stuff on the winder still because mm -hmm. it has some things that aren't there they aren't listed in the document in other places yeah so they're listed in the material so yeah some discrepancies between different diagrams and stuff right so what what do we do I'm next then almost finished I think I've got I've got the, uh, the visual bomb pretty well done. I wanted to double check and look for any extra links or better sources to put on that and just look over it in general again. But I'm almost finished with the the winder bomb, other than some of the confusion with the, the parts that I gotta figure out because they're not in the diagrams. But mm -hmm. I think it's mostly ready. From his documents alone, it's pretty easy to just order the parts list and uh, you know build a version of it yeah it would be good to reconcile the parts list like maybe put a check 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 by all the parts like as we go through yeah. the v-bomb the visual bill of materials probably to make sure that yeah i guess i'll yeah i'll copy his list into the, the slide maybe and then put some checks on uh Mm-hmm. So one good thing to do would be to do a complete uh, CAD that we can actually link the, as we do the CAD, we can, like this one here on page number seven, that's a nice one. It shows a lot of the different parts. Uh, we should have one like that for the entire, you know, for the overall extruder, like for all the pieces. Um, the start would be to ask him if he's got those files. That would be number one, and then go... Yeah, I, I assume because the files, I was going to get to the CAD, I figured I'd email him. He yeah. probably can link them or add them to the Thingiverse files as well. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm familiar with those, their step files, but I assume those convert to FreeCAD yeah yes yeah. so you can import step okay. yeah um yeah this is pretty good um how much is that gear motor there is that uh, the bill of materials see, there I, can list. I thought about listing the prices on some of those motor it's, those motors are a little bit more the small ones oh that one's like 13 dollars small ones are 13 that big one on the extruder is a torque motor yeah that was one issue i was noticing on the extruder system there are some electronics i was a little concerned about some of the fault tolerance in the electronics and i noticed that the gear motor says that it's the motor's torque is overrated for the gearbox so i started thinking there, there might be a failure mode where it just trashes the gearbox and we should at least put a fuse in there or something like that uh huh. Because it's, it's an eighty dollar motor. It's the most expensive part of the extruder, I think. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fifteen RPM, and he just has it either on or off. Is that the idea? At present. Yeah. Um. It, he just has manual switches on the front of that panel. And it looks to me like he lets the heater come up the temperature and then just switches it on. So yeah. That it, I figured it was a little more automated, but I, I think that that's an easy way to do it. Because from what I could tell, I found a manual for that PID temperature controller, but it didn't have a lot of extra information beyond wiring, um, mm -hmm. like about how to set the buttons and stuff. But it, it doesn't look that complicated. It has four, four buttons or something. So, it, it looks like it might be able to control more things, but that it mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. changing stuff up on that. So, yeah. it probably has an alarm, at least, where some of the others, they say they have an alarm. So, I think, I think that person has an alarm where it probably tells you when it's up to temperature, and then you just switch the motor on. And I, I don't know if there could be timing issues uh, 
controlling the temperature, it's not going to burn it or anything. So yeah, if, yeah. Even if somebody leaves it sitting there, uh, I don't think it'll burn the plastic. Yeah. So definitely there would be a case for getting the full cat in place so that's some of the next steps here so let's let's talk about the next steps and how we can handle that here so slide duplicate slide so next step, let's talk about next steps um, and let's talk about uh, we can allocate any of these steps so definitely the Definitely there's the CAD. Um, I mean, really like a build procedure that's, I guess, better, like refactored build procedure. So basically select any of multiple paths. Like if there's multiple ways to do things, just select one, select single path, let's call that. Um, detail out missing pieces I mean adapt to specific if there's any part changes so one thing to do is to verify that all the parts can be obtained but make make any adaptations and yeah yeah I found links I think to all all the parts that look good and most of it was off of his list so I wanted to stick with those parts uh, some of the parts in there too in the electronics they're they could be almost out of spec if they're operated uh, for some reason they pull if there's more current on some of those there they might not last very long, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. if they're actually being, if there's actually that much load on them, but. Yeah. I mean, what would be. be able to find others, but. Right. Like, like, see, these are very nice diagrams, like, like this diagram here. What would be nice is if we have a link to. Yeah. Like this level of detail for everything. Like, so say, say you got your, you know, like let's take a look at one of your visual bills of materials. I mean, there's tons of parts in there that are like, you know, like you don't point to every single part. There's a few missing. Maybe, maybe to like, um, do an arrow and a link to the specific part. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be what parts are we actually buying, right? So. So this is good. Maybe like the next step would be to say, now are all these linked? Okay, yeah, they are. That's good. The photos are linked. Yeah, okay. And there are some picture links and text and places you can see those. Yeah, so what I do typically is just put a boundary around that to know that, yeah, there's a link around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's it's getting pretty pretty exact. So, yeah. What we might want to do is now take the what you have for the visual BOM and all the parts that you have already listed and go against his, like probably reconcile the two, the visual versus the final. Because, you know, it could end up that we get all the parts in the bill materials and we say, oops, we're missing this, we're missing that, and so forth. So before I would want to build this, I would want to say, okay, the two are reconciled. So I would say like a yeah, big a big I point. Yeah, is this one. I yep. started I started off of the his build material list and yep. then tried to identify all of the parts and photos and where they go, including the bolt count and screw count. So I think that uh, the, the numbers that he has listed on the build material seem to match what's in the actual photos and diagrams. Uh huh. So maybe. Um, so how far are you on that? Because that would be a, I guess, a big step. On on the extruder, I've gotten that done pretty thoroughly. I think. Um, I think I've gotten the whole extruder part. The winder part was a little bit more confusing in that aspect. The bomb and some of the diagrams are not um, the same in some ways. Or I, 
Let's see, that's a... Uh-huh. Okay, so... Okay. And as far as the winder, is there a separate document besides this one? Um, no, it, the slides for the winder are just below the slides for the extruder. Uh, but uh, in, the, the one, in the PDF? Oh, the PDF, yes. There, there is a PDF in the zip file for the winder. He separated uh, there is? two devices. Okay, so that's in the other folder. In the winder folder. Okay. All right. Wow. Let me see. Um, Lyman spooler zip. So you're saying that for the the extruder, you've checked off every single part from his BOM against yours, against your visual one? Yes, I started with his original bill of materials, in the PDF, just the list, and uh, put all those, copied all the text from the, his bill of material into the uh, visual bill of material, and that was my starting point oh, Okay. For getting all of those parts into the, with the images. Okay. Oh, excellent, yeah, excellent. I, I accounted for all the bolts and parts that way. And then, was his, um, was his build materials incomplete then, or was it complete? It looks to be complete. According to his diagrams, uh, it lists enough bolts and screws, I think, for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the only thing that was a trip was the fan option. Uh, I don't know whether that fan option came with screws or not it looked like he used some other bolts for that or, yeah or with the same bolts that were extra i can't really count i think i counted it only takes a couple of screws or bolts to hold a fan on that uh, extension part yeah uh, yeah Sounds good. And his photos sometimes don't match to his photos with different parts in there, and he, he changed it. He went to simpler ways. It looks like he had a gearbox in the photos a bunch with a motor, and he eliminated that and just went with duct tape. Mm -hmm. Just coupled, coupled some uh, pieces together with duct tape for a flexible coupler. Yeah. And They're just for tension. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, let's see. So, let's go back to the next steps here. Um, 
Yeah, no, that's good progress here. Um... Yeah, so the question would be for Dixon and for Joseph. Um, is there any ways we can get involved in this? So... Yeah, let's see, we've got four people, I think, yeah, Dixon, Joseph, Cassie are all listed on the phone on extruder now. Yeah. Uh, right. I don't know if they, they haven't looked at the file thoroughly, they probably have some catching up to do just by looking over it. Maybe I need to make some more notes. Yeah. Uh-huh, so, guys, Joseph and Dixon, there's visual bill of materials work to be done, basically pasting in, just kind of verifying that all the parts kind of match up, and and also, Abe, are you uh, cutting and pasting parts from the internet on top of what the parts were in? from the document itself when there were some parts that weren't maybe shown well? Uh, the, some of the photos are from the bomb links that are listed. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I tried to make sure they look like the same. They did look like the same parts yeah. pretty much, but there's you know, different options for some of those generic parts. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, bolts. But I, I mostly went with links to his, from his bomb. Yeah. Uh, his build materials was pretty good. There were a couple of places, even with McMaster Car, I guess, where the, his build materials, the numbers or part numbers or serial numbers are incorrect, or they're outdated. Uh-huh. Including on McMaster Car, I had to go back and find some of those. I had a little confusion earlier, but I think I figured all of that out. Right. And an unwinder part, like the idea there is the knob that, that that basically controls the speed, so it's on and off, but at a very well regulated speed. Is that the idea, or is that winder? No, the winder. Wait, is the winder going the the whole time? Okay, I think. Let's see. Yeah, he has an on off switch on it. It's all on top of that power supply, and I think that's just that turns the AC on and off. So he must turn it on. And didn't let it, it, it just runs based on the limit switches, and I think that's mainly it, is limit and, switches. Right, and the knob on the, like for example, the knob right there on the, whatever he the... He says in the, in the documentation there that he sets those both to 6 volts, the potentiometer, I think it just varies the voltage of the 6 volts, and yeah. I'm, that's why I'm guessing you need to look at the electrical diagram, but I'm assuming that... Mm -hmm. 12 volt power supply he's got those two things in, in parallel and he says he runs up about 6 volts and that keeps the motors I guess uh, running at the right speed I think he talks about that detail a little bit more maybe he turns it up a little for some reason yeah yeah and one is uh, both of them are geared down right They're, one is the geared thing uh, no in his photos, he keeps showing that uh, rectangular yeah. gearbox in there, yeah. and in the other photos, you'll see some photos where it's not there, and he said that he just went, uh, he eliminated the gearbox, and there's just a duct tape coupler between mm -hmm. the motor and the uh, shaft for the pulley. Well, so, so how fast are those motors spinning there? So it's got an internal gearbox. Yeah, they're geared motors, both of them. Okay. And they have two different RPMs. On okay. Those, one for the winder and one for the All right. polar. Yeah, I see. All right. Just adjust the voltage to get that right, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because that adjustment could be easy to get the tension. 
was probably a fairly fine adjustment on the, the potentiometers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I see different, different, slightly different voltages in some of the photos there on the uh, yeah. regulators. So yeah. around around six volts. Yeah. That could be tricky to adjust, I guess, depending on the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what? Yeah, I think I think the clear part to do here is yeah, continue on a visual build materials. I think the big part is like pulling down all the CAD files, like whether it's so first of all, of course, ask Lyman about the full CAD. Yeah. And then whatever's missing, we just gotta start drawing up little pieces. Uh or just downloading files from the internet. Like I know McMaster Car has all the files online, for example. So so CAD. So for the CAD so ask Hugh Lyman about about CAD and then fill in missing pieces so there's definitely like I know McMaster car has files you can download uh, and then just CAD up from scratch whatever is missing it could be, you know, approximate or just kind of like, not super detailed. Um, yeah, and then, of course, some of the parts are just kind of pieces of things that are put together, and the wire and so on. Just have to kind of detail and cat up. More experience doing that kind of stuff. And uh, there's the heat band, the pipes, and stuff like that. It should be pretty easy to do with cat, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of accounting work. I think the, the way to organize around, definitely, like, if, if we build in all the CAD, so if we have a full CAD model, we can take that and do really nice, like, not be restricted to his diagrams, then we can have, like, a more complete diagram where we can lay it all out and show the explosions of different things and links to part numbers and things, and even even, like, the assembly procedures, we can do simple... Things like here's how it goes together, exploded part animations, which we have done before, which is pretty easy within FreeCAD. Um, so once, so I think we should focus around the CAD. Um, so, guys, what do you think? Um, so Dixon as well as Joseph, you guys want to feed back a little bit? What do you guys? Uh, how you guys think you contribute? Um, so to clarify, I think what you're talking about is. Um, doing a CAD uh, workup of this project from the ground up based on Lyman's work yeah. so that we can be flexible with it. That's the yeah. general direction you're talking about going next, right? Yep, yep, that's about right. Mm -hmm. um, so while you've been talking, I've been looking looking at this, uh, those PDF files. Are those zip files his package design documents, or are those documents that uh, OSC has been building? I'm not quite clear on that. That's his, the zip file, that's all his. And okay. our document is the, the Google Doc. Right, okay. We're just and trying to refactor, make sense out of... There's not too much on the wiki yet. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, for the first part for me is going to be to familiarize myself with the project a little more. Yeah. Uh, but... I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I'm comfortable uh, gathering CAD files. Yeah. You know, as, as probably the first step, because just as I'm learning free CAD. Yep. Um, is the most obvious useful thing I think I could do, especially for the, the fasteners, um, finding or approximating CAD files for all of the off the shelf components, I think is probably the most obvious thing I think I can contribute to unless there's something you guys can think of. You're saying compile CAD off the, the on, online components for various components, yeah, various off-shelf components? Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm thinking, but I might mm -hmm. misunderstand how much is actually put together. I haven't looked through the files in this the file yet, just the PDFs. Yeah, the big determining factor is going to be what Hugh already has, and then right. we want to fill. And I'm sure he's not going to have everything because to do the exhaustive CAD takes a lot of effort. Um, right. 
so so build on so existing CAD there compile CAD for I mean that would be like from scratch build it from scratch now the other thing is for the SDL files uh, we can start you know the SDLs we can't the general idea about SDL files because they're a mesh format when when you get them into FreeCAD you can't really work with them so we have to always convert them into into FreeCAD format like solid objects so right. the idea there is that we probably wanna see there it goes back to the trick of what I was talking about about file size yeah we can have the, the files in FreeCAD but they could either be too large or you can't work with them because they're they're SDLs so we probably have to end up converting them and maybe drawing them from scratch or even sometimes simplifying them understanding that we already have them like for the 3d prints they have to be the exact files those the SDLs are good already but we might have to draw them up again from the perspective of having the full CAD model so so we can basically say for the SDL files we can start combining them um, I'm not sure exactly what the limits are to working with the SDL files within FreeCAD I mean I guess the, the first thing to try would be okay if I if I import all those into FreeCAD can I work with them efficiently or or you just can't because they're hard to manipulate uh, maybe you can explore that like for example if we have the CAD file that's got a mixture of of free CAD drawn files or step imports and then you're mixing a bunch of SDL in there is that gonna work I don't know before I started doing the bomb I tried pulling in the STL files and working with them I tried converting them and that was sometimes it was they're simple enough that it kind of worked but there were issues so I think it's easier because they're such simple cylinders and, and cubes and stuff anyway they're easy to just take into FreeCAD and then just trace over them in the sketch pad yeah uh, with the sketcher workbench it's it shouldn't be that difficult to redraw those by just tracing back over them yeah, yeah I would suggest that too because um, I know we have so it yeah go ahead something um, that you'd like to test me on is converting by whatever method, whether it's direct conversion or, or rebuilding um, yeah. all the STL files. Yeah, that would definitely be a worthwhile task. Mm -hmm. Because that way we can okay. come up with a complete model. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, and that's... For the extruder and the spooler, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of work there, so maybe, I don't know, can we get Joseph to start CADing up some other parts? So basically import into FreeCAD and then just go into Sketcher and just trace over them and re remake them up and by drawing them up with Sketcher. So you have to kind of pick up, beef up on a Sketcher where you do drawings in 2D and then you can extrude them out to 3D. And then you can work, make new features on any face using the Sketcher. So... Uh, that would be a task that a number of people can take on in fact I mean maybe if you divide it I mean because there's so many pieces there's the spooler there's the winder there's the extruder and there's that there's that um, that other limit switch part there's like four parts what if we just say hey people let's um, start catting those up together from SDLs I mean start maybe with SDLs um, but then also start putting and then so let's say we redraw them in sketcher and then we just start importing other parts and making up other parts that would be kind of the so step number one is start with redraw with sketcher then import import step files like for example from McMaster car And there's a lot of places online that have step files, so it's kind of one of those things where you kind of have to search a little bit. Um, and then right. create entire create the entire assemblies. 
Now, but the way we want to organize that, so let me just shrink this down a little bit as we flesh this out. So start a page, there's a, so I put as um, 1C is the filament extruder part library, just like the D3D part library. So use the D3D part library to start a gallery of parts. So, so if you look at the D3D part library wiki page, it's got some text on it and then it goes down to here's like this gallery of parts so that would be useful to do to basically once we get all the parts put them in a gallery because these are a lot of these are like for example the first three ones here are for 3d printing and then other ones are for the workflow where you just download them and you you build the things in FreeCAD like if you want to build something different in FreeCAD so that's the idea of the the gallery and uh, so I would say start with the gallery and then the index would be a good thing too because remember that you know once we draw up something we might want to optimize those files or rebuild them and stuff so it would be nice to have an index which this index like on a D3D part library page combines the bill of materials with the CAD so we've got the bill of materials right there and then the CAD so we have like a one-stop shop for the entire build. I think that's a really cool thing, this uh, overall inventory. But what I'll say for that is, um, so we can start the extruder part library based on D3D part library. Clone that page. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, then do a gallery and then do an index, a master index, which is a BOM plus links to CAD files and then plus the links to the optimized files. Like, because for some, like, once we get into the bigger overall assemblies we want to like simplify some of them like initially you want all the super detailed parts because you want to know everything about it but as we get up into the final final assembly like if say we do one CAD file of, of the entire winder puller extruder like that's gonna get pretty heavy so we want to start maybe doing some simplifications there too so so there should be that place for the simplified CAD um, but the one thing we don't have yet is the like we do have the BOM on the on the within the PDF but that's not editable right so we wanna turn that into an editable doc like like here but maybe worry about that for later uh, so the flow would be well no I think we wanna I think we wanna get that master index as, as soon as possible because then we can put all the links to that and then as soon as we have um, the things made up we can start pasting them into a gallery so we see all the pieces all the individual pieces that's quite a bit of work there. I mean, that's that's a lot of work. But I would say maybe we should start yeah. with, so base this on a D3D part library and start with index, master index file. Um, yeah, that master index would be the equivalent of this index here. I'm going to link directly to that. So there's the index. Yeah, definitely want to, I mean, spreadsheets are good for this. I mean, because it's really about managing like a whole bunch of parts. Yeah. So start with a master index. So we'll, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with, with creating the, the extruder part library, um, put an index then, and put the gallery in, and then get to work on doing the STL conversions. Yep. That would be perfect. Uh, so do the STL conversions. Uh, so that means redraw with Sketcher import them and step or then yeah and then start creating more complex assemblies of parts <clears throat> so the index should have like first is the unique parts which is the like 1 through 40 here which are just parts and then there's assemblies and then there's final assembly yeah mm-hmm that sounds like a plan Yeah. Oliver, were you the other person that was tasked yeah. to this? I can't remember. Oliver, yeah. There's Oliver, Cassie, 
and Joseph. No, oh, yeah. sorry, no, 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 Oliver, right. no, Oliver, actually, no, Oliver is on the CNC torture. It was uh, Joseph and Cass, Cassie as well. Um, do we miss somebody there? Was somebody else on that? Just me, Dixon, Joseph, and Cassie are listed on okay. the dev team page. Yep, no, that should be good, that should be good. Um, so let's, let's divvy up so we can start, um... So next steps would be okay. So like a lot of data entry to start with, or just yeah. copying and pasting uh, into those different lists. Yeah. So let's. Yeah, Dixon. Since you're talking about the yeah, set up the page. Okay. Uh, set up the extruder part library. Uh, filament extruder part library page Got it. and then start you know then start start filling it but with what so Dixon let's maybe have you do do it on um, I mean there's the extruder since you're piping up here there's the winder let's have uh, maybe Joseph on that and then uh, spooler and then as far as Abe you're continuing on the visual bill of materials verification Abe so how do you fit in here Yeah, and then your links can feed into the master index, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's some links on the extruder part that are ready to go into the spreadsheet. Yeah, and what would be nice is uh, once we've got all the parts, we can do like, so in FreeCAD, it's relatively easy to, to do the exploded part animations, meaning that played in reverse that's a that's how a, an object goes together so maybe once we have the entire model we can show okay this part goes first and we just actually show the entire assembly coming together uh, which is not so hard to do it within FreeCAD as long as FreeCAD doesn't crash and which means that we got to have the the files all kind of uh, done pro done properly as in um, constrained properly so hopefully that all works within FreeCAD um, yeah 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 that would be pretty nice Mm hmm All right. Joseph here, quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, who, um, as I kind of get up, up to speed on this, yeah. um, uh, who's my sort of point of contact if I need occasional babysitting or questions about resources? Yeah, yeah. I would say certainly go to Abe, who's been working on this, but, but myself as well. I mean, Abe's kind of like uh, master of the extruder yeah. right now. Yeah. And of course, we can just post that stuff to the network, uh, the mines based network. That way it's documented. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you ask questions, the procedure is post it at network.opensourceecology.org. And let's still, by the way, just keep using the 3D printer group there until we need to split off because there's not enough traffic there yet. But yeah. post a comment there, and if you want to grab somebody's attention, just email that person. Say, "Hey, um, respond to my comment." Gotcha. Yeah, and then you can ask me about more higher level, higher level stuff as well. 
definitely but yeah we should definitely feel free like i check the network the open source ecology.org all the time so that's a good way or just email me uh, yeah i mean we're we're all pulling on this together so yeah also i was thinking just while i'm you know kind of getting up to trying to get up to speed with FreeCAD, never having yeah. done any of this stuff to work with yeah with electronics i thought you know um if there's any miscellaneous stuff that comes up where you just sort of need an office monkey to go look up i don't know prices or just go hunt down you know, the information i thought maybe that's something i could i could do if, if somebody's time is better spent working on more complicated problems yeah yeah um definitely will keep that in mind um i think there's yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll keep that in mind how how to make that work. And probably some clear tasks like as we go in this project, I think some clear kind of like entry level tasks will emerge. But um yeah, I think you should definitely you know, like for example, taking a very simple part in FreeCAD and putting that into the master index, you know, like there's a cylinder or like a little, you know, block or this with holes. It's relatively easy to to draw it up in FreeCAD and so that, you know, you practice with very, very simple parts because someone still has to do that and then, you know, it takes time and accounting. So I think the probably easiest thing would be take some of the things that are really like two-dimensional extrusions and uh, start working on that as some of the very, very simplest parts and then you get familiar with it and you get comfortable with how to make more complex parts, I think, yeah. That that's one thing, but but I think some things will also emerge as we go forward and kind of keep keep track of um, simple entry level tasks. Yeah, that's great. Um, and just to clarify on the part library, the winder and the spooler will be assemblies within that overall part library, right? They'll be all be on the same page. Yes, so we start with individual parts, so maybe we have a section for just individual parts, and then we might have another section of that's assemblies, and then the final assembly, yeah. Okay, just check. Yep, definitely. Well, that sounds good. I think we've got plenty to do on this. That's a really, I mean, this is a really important project in the sense that getting a nice working home-scale winder like that, spooler, extruder, for film and making, I mean, I think that's very important because that will allow us to, like, if we actually get that right, then we can start doing things like printing, even things like fence posts or dimensional lumber, because otherwise that's com prohibitive in terms of filament cost. But if our filament cost is literally free, then we can be printing large objects for like real construction stuff, like hydroponics, aquaponics parts that always are come in contact with moisture. A lot of stuff we can get, uh, lots of value for actual large parts. That's important. So that is a cool project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know we can make it happen because I know there's like, there's a couple of these small desktop filament extruders out there. So we know this stuff works. And that that means you don't need, like typically the industry standard is that you have this long pool of water through which like the filament cools off and it gets massaged properly but it's a big complex system but I also do know that there's very tiny desktop ones that there are some commercial proprietary ones that do work so we know we can make this work it just we gotta we gotta figure out you know start with this very simple one and then see what needs to happen what, what accuracy we get and see how we need to improve it yeah All right. Yeah, I, 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 just, I have some school for the rest of the day, but I'll have that page created by the end of the day. All right. Excellent. Yep. So th I think that's about all for now. That was a pretty long meeting, but I think we got started pretty well on, on all this. And uh, we'll continue from there. So unless there's any other questions, we can, we can uh, take off at this point. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks everybody for bearing with that. That was a pretty long meeting and we'll continue chatting. So feel free to continue the discussion on email and the network.opensourceecology.org.
Thanks a lot.